I'm here at one of Zometry's 3D printing facilities where we're going to see some industrial scale 3D printing. I'm joined by Greg Paulson, who's one of Zometry's application engineers. So Greg, can you tell me a little more about Zometry and what you do here? Zometry is a digital manufacturing marketplace. So we have a platform that allows you to go online, click, drag, upload 3D files, get instant pricing, and we actually offer over eight different additive manufacturing technologies, as well as a slew of different tech from uh, CNC machining, injection molding, urethane casting, die casting, you name it. We're connected to over 5,000 uh, capable manufacturers. So what we're gonna see today it's just a little bit of what Zometry does from a manufacturing scale standpoint. So what kind of machines are we going to be looking at today? Yeah, so today we're at a facility that's running plastics. And in this case, we're, we're running a few different uh, additive manufacturing technologies, starting with FDM, which you're probably most familiar with. We also have a powder bed fusion technology, so selective laser sintering, which makes parts using nylon powder. And last but not least, we offer PolyJet at this facility, which is, uh, can do everything from like rubber-like prototypes to full spectrum color 3D printing. Let's get our safety glasses on and head over to the factory. So Greg, why don't you tell me what you've got set up in this room? This is what I would consider you know, the desktop version. We're starting here because it's familiar, and we're running some Prusa printers specifically for the material PLA. How have these Prusa printers been holding up for you? These overall, they do a really good job. Definitely do require some more hands-on work, especially in the early stages of the print. But for what they're doing, which is this prototyping PLA work, uh, they work great. Our FDM 3D printers are Stratasys Fortis machines. This machine here, the 900s, have a two foot by three foot by three foot build area. The 450s, our smaller units, are 14 by 16 by 16 inches. This is your build plate in an FDM platform. So this will actually be kind of held through a vacuum table on top of the platform here. So that's that two foot by three foot build area. And you can see the, the profile of the printed part here had a circular profile for it. And that's some of the supporting structure underneath. When I use large machines, it's typically for those parts that are over 14 or 16 inches. I can do smaller parts in arrays, but usually if I'm doing smaller pieces, I'm gonna fit them on the platform uh, that fits and then run multiple platforms. That allows me to ship parts faster. Why do I use these industrial machines versus Prusas for, the, for this industrial level printing? Reliability, because I gave you a promised ship date and that's something that we wanna to commit to. So we run industrial machines here at Zometry because we can commit to those lead times and the quality of the parts that are output. So Greg, what makes these machines so reliable? Everything about this is stability, precision, and control of the entire atmosphere environment. And that really helps you uh, get a consistent result, whether it's the first time you order or the 40th time you order this part. So what's this one doing? It looks like so, it's moving down. So this is a build calibration. As part of our quality control, we actually do a, a calibration run, which is that little grid on the side there. Our team's gonna go and use an otoscope and essentially take a look at the spacing between layers and other factors, making sure that this material changeover was done successfully. But we calibrate between every changeover to make sure that we get quality results. These are things that you can't do with a desktop 3D printer. This part will finish on Monday. It's Friday right now. It's been running for 88 hours of a total of 155 hours. So this is a part that's using almost that full three feet of Z axis in it. But that's you know super important to us because if that fails, I just lost 90 hours. And that's really big because that reset doesn't mean that I make up for 90 hours. It just means I got to print another 155 hours. Uh, but that's something that you can do with these types of this type of equipment is reliably run these huge parts. If you look around this uh, facility, about a quarter of it is just filament itself. We are running these at a very high capacity 24 seven. These are all cartridges uh, for the Fortis machine. So inside these boxes is kind of a metal housed uh, spool of material. Uh, the metal housing helps keep moisture out. It's full of desiccant on the inside. And then obviously your build material. And we just consumed so much atzometry building customer parts that it's a never ending delivery system for us. These machines happen to be EOS P396s. Uh, this material is PA2200, which is a very, very common nylon 12 material. The powder itself looks like flour. You need that fine powder so you get a nice even layer and it centers evenly as well. So what you hear right here, bump, 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 that's a bladder system feeding powder upwards into the top of the machine. That bladder pump is loading into two feed cartridges that are each side of the build platform and that's the powder being recoded here. So because we're a production facility, we have this upgrade to our machines 
so we can always keep a fresh supply of powders without doing constant changeovers. This is a selective laser sintering build chamber. It's about 13 by 13 by 23 or 26 inches, depending on what you count as a, a chamber capacity. But either way, there's a lot of room and opportunity to make parts. So if you imagine putting parts up and nesting them in a way where they could be as little as two millimeters apart from each other, you could put a lot of pieces in here. There is something to consider when you do build an SLS though, and that's part density. I don't wanna just stack this full of 50% part because there's a lot of thermal weirdness that happens when you're melting that much plastic in one area. Our build density is typically somewhere between a six to 10%, and that tends to get you the best results for this printing method. What's happening here is there is a fine layer of nylon being deposited. That layer is then spread across, so this is recoding, and that layer is heated up. So there's actually a thermal sensor and heaters that are heating up that layer to the right temperature. Now it's starting the scan. So let me try to get a side view here. Oh, wow. So you can see the uh, parts actually starting to scan. So a laser is just very lightly etching this heated build chamber enough to create a sintering effect, which is melting that cross section of the part as well as fusing that melt to the layer underneath. Because it is suspended in the unsintered nylon powder, I'm able to float these parts. You know, they're not sinking, they're not raising up, they just are. And that gives you a lot of opportunity to build parts and have high throughputs. Any jo typical job that we're running is somewhere between 30 kind of medium to large parts or 300 uh, plus small parts. These two machines behind me actually outcompete on the output of those FDM machines every month. You can produce thousands upon thousands of parts with selective laser sintering because you could actually not only nest on just a flat build plane, but in the Z direction as well. But once they start running, they run for about somewhere between 22 to 28 hours. In that time, they're sintering uh, layer by layer, about four and a half thousandths per layer, and making your parts. After that, they cool for about two thirds that time, and then we break them out. So the normal lead time for SLS is two to three business days. So I wanted to show you some cool properties about SLS nylon. What can I do with this? Super general purpose material, because if I design thin features, I can make parts that really have a good amount of flexibility to them. Not quite living hinge, but you still get some really cool function and ductility out of it. If I build something more structural, I'm building things like with ribs or cavities or, with, or a little bit of a thicker wall, I could get something that's very stiff, very structural in the exact same nylon material. After I, I build these parts, I'm treasure hunting. I'm looking for these parts in a large uh, volume of loose powder. Sometimes these parts are smaller. We can often nest those together and put them into a computer generated center box, which allows us to put a group of parts together in a way where I can still handle it post-process, even bring into bead blasting to clean it off. And then later on, I just open up the box, clean up the parts and ship them out separately. It looks like we've got some parts to play with here. Usually the fun parts, like the, these type of things are, are items that we're making in house. Uh, just kind of for fun and to show off, this dragon piece is actually an all-in-one 3D print. One of the things you could do in SLS, just like you could float separate parts together, you could also float interlocking parts and print all-in-one pieces. This has the secondary finish of chemical vapor smoothing. So usually when you do an SLS print, you kind of have more of a uh, sugar cube-like finish and feel to it. Chemical vapor smoothing actually seals the surface. It's not a coating. It will literally liquefy the nylon in a controlled setting. The nylon will kind of run and smooth on itself and then harden back in shape. So it gives you a sealed surface without adding an additional coating or material to it. What are all these boxes? These are brass screw to expand uh, press fit inserts. And it's very common as a, uh, as a service for zometry for us to add those in. It's a lot easier for me to take a drill bit, zip in, make a perfect circle for you, and then heat stake an insert in and guarantee that that thread works for you. And it's something I just highly, highly recommend, especially if you're making practical parts. These master samples are showing the different dye tones that we're currently running in this building and the different finishes. So this would be a red part, standard printed, dyed red. This would be a red part, media tumbled and dyed red. You know, most show offy here is a part that has been vapor smoothed and dyed red. We use these master sam samples to get an idea of the quality that we should assure our customers. Finding the right dye for, um, for SLS has been a decades long discovery. Does dyeing the parts affect the tolerances? No, there's, there's no uh, tolerance uh, being affected because essentially the dye is just penetrating the um, outer quarter millimeter of the surface of the part. So 
you know, very little of that part is actually being pigmented. If I took these through a bandsaw, they would be white underneath. Polyjet uh, is a 3D printing resin-based platform that deposits micro droplets of a UV curable material. Um, as the print head goes back and forth, uh, it is able to mix those just like an inkjet printer would to make a color print. These are full spectrum 3D prints that come out of the Polyjet platform. What's really cool about this is it does bring you into the color age and you can do some really great color matching. This is like a super fun thing, but this is a printed part. Polyjet used to be known for the multi-material aspect of it. So rubber-like, clear-like, opaque materials, and that's stuff that we still do regularly here. But with the newest uh, generation of machines, you can also upload a full color file or even just hit that color that you want if you have a brand color or a logo and you can actually apply that directly to your part and we can print it out. And it really is like a giant inkjet printer. Like it's, so there's multiple print heads on here uh, that are fed up to um, essentially the ink, if you will, which is uh, the printing material. I want to give a huge thanks to Zometry for inviting me over to their Maryland plant. I've used their services before professionally, and it was really cool to have a behind the scenes look and see how the parts are actually made. If you wanna see more videos like this, remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Also, if you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the comments section below, and I might be able to do a Q&A with Greg in a future video and answer viewer questions. He's got a lot of knowledge and experience in 3D printing, so he's a great person to ask those tougher questions. Plus, he's a really nice guy. He even offered me a donut on the way out. You can actually make a full spectrum print and you can also trick your friends. Something's wrong with this donut. I'll leave a link to where you can check out Zometry's instant quoting tool. If you need something professionally printed or CNC machined, it's really easy to just upload your parts there and see how much it would cost to have it made through Zometry. It's a really good tool to explore different manufacturing methods because they'll tell you how expensive it is for a bunch of different options. So even if you're not planning on buying through Zometry, it can be fun to upload your parts and explore different manufacturing methods. I've found their prices to be pretty competitive and their results are simply fantastic, so I'd highly recommend them as a 3D printing service for professional engineers. So thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next episode.